Hello and welcome back everybody to the Cancel for Maintenance podcast. If this is your first time joining us, we talk about the non-glamorous life of aircraft maintenance. Our goal here is to give some insight into aircraft maintenance, bring some laughs, and give some moments of relief in your day to prevent mishaps. I am your host, Six. I'm MVP. And our third man, Shoreline, is there sitting nice and silently in the background to ensure that our audio and our faces stay pretty for the radio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this episode is a request slash suggestion from one of our patrons, and it's actually a pretty good topic. Uh, it involves parts, uh, specifically owner-produced parts. Uh I don't have too much experience with general aviation, so this was a fairly uh, unfam- well, this was an unfamiliar subject to me for the most part until I started digging into it, and then MVP can talk way better about it because he's seen most of this stuff in his previous fields of work. But for the unversed person, uh, whenever an aircraft needs to get fixed or it has some repairs that that, that it requires, we need parts for this, and we get this in commonly three different avenues uh the first one being getting or getting the parts from the original maker or manufacturer who made the plane or who made the parts uh the second one is like a third party who's authorized to make replacements for whatever those parts are and Which then I the third the PMA certificate right yes PMA that's it uh PMA being like a uh part uh, manufacturer approval yeah, parts manufacturer approval, sorry. And the third one being f- just get it from a salvage yard or a junkyard, which technically is uh, an original m- manufactured part. It's just trash. We we get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, well, that's happened a lot, actually. And whether it's private or uh, uh, com- private commercial or military aviation, I mean, uh, out here in the desert, kind of where Six and I live, there's a few boneyards scattered around the area. And I know uh, for a fact, like you see all the time, there's different service trucks over there salvaging parts off of these uh, aircraft in the boneyards to keep a few of the older birds still out there flying in serviceable condition. Um, One of the big ones being, and this is probably 10 to 12 years ago now, but uh, what they were doing is they were coming up and they were getting on the backs of 747s and they were if you, you know what a 747 looks like, kind of has that hump sort of on the back mm-hmm. and right there where the hump meets sort of what I'll call the part of the fuselage where it starts to level out. Um, that skin was buckling on 747s um, uh, just from the stress of flying or whatever. But uh, what they would do is they would go up there uh, because it was a lot faster and cheaper. They would go up there and start drilling out all the rivets and peel that skin off there and then <laughs> run back down to like LAX and start riveting the back skin yeah. uh, on these older 747s, you know? Yeah. And as shady as that sounds, like that's totally okay, right? As long as like um, from the place you're getting at, it's, it's approved and all this and that. So, but yeah, that's totally legal. And to kind of break it down just a little bit for again for people who are unversed right uh for instance like the original equipment manufactured part that's again the people who originally made the part or the plane right they have uh all the specifications all the engineering that went behind it all the design features the airworthiness features etc 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 and uh, what we're seeing, uh, especially in today's day and age, is a lot of these original manufactured parts, they're either in limited supply because they didn't expect to make as much as that was in demand, or they stopped making them altogether because they've been obsolete for who knows how long. Uh, people in general aviation uh, side of things, like certain Cessna, certain Beechcraft, certain Pipers, they either yeah. no lo- they no longer exist. Or they they don't make them anymore, and s- especially for general aviation peeps, some of the aircraft that they do have, they're like what we call legacy planes. Like their grandfather or great great grandfather bought it at some point in time, and you know they they got it at that golden age when things were just shuffling out the door easy, no problem, no issues finding replacements or finding uh, different parts for cheap. Um, but since then, it's been like. 20, 30, 50 plus years since those were made or those were manufactured and now they become harder and harder to find. 
it's kind of like uh certain sports cars from a certain time period like you'll see them but it's very rare and the ones you do find are kind of beat up in some sort of way or they require some type of rework to get it running again and um that's actually been like a whole collector's thing where they find like the original serial numbers that went to the car or the original um uh, specs from a certain model series stuff like that and depending on what needs to get replaced can get extremely expensive especially like if it's for parts that have like a long life limit like we weren't expecting these to go bad uh, or they weren't expecting them to go bad for at least a couple thousand to a couple hundred thousand uh, flight hours or x amount of days or whatever the case may be uh, say like a like wing spars or stringers or um, like it, it, the engine it's uh, parts of the engine itself or the fuse some parts of the fuselage itself just they just weren't meant to go bad or they just didn't expect it to go bad so fast and then, of course, 50 plus years later, you know what I mean? Time and and um, the environment is just going to wear these out. But at this point, you know, we've already been 50 years past on the aircraft model. We just don't give a shit no more. <laughs> 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 you know? Uh, and then the second yep. one, uh, MVP mentioned it again, is the PMA, the parts manufacturer approval. This is stuff like, say, like, uh, kind of thing like aftermarket parts. Like, they are separate company or a separate third party that makes uh, stuff that's almost identical to the original manufactured part. And in order for them to be able to do that, they have to have some kind of approval from the FAA saying, or whatever the air flight authority is in your country saying like, you are making this part for this plane using these design specifications. And it's almost exactly like the original, right? I'm, uh, we'll talk about copyright and uh, patents and all that other shit but for the most part they make it almost almost identical or at least functions in the same way as the original sometimes better right and a lot of third company third party companies they do this because it's something that's no longer made it's on h extremely high demand and they feel like well i can make some money off of this because how many cessna owners piper owners and beechcraft owners need certain parts and they need it now and these aren't made no more so here I am. I got my designs. I got my FA approval. Who wants some? You know, <laughs> and yeah, and, and a lot of people don't realize, but there is, you know, people talking about making money in aviation, but the real money in aviation is the parts manufacturing. Oh yes, I mean, I mean yeah, because a lot of parts are life limited. Yes, uh, or or get corroded or whatever else, and you got to swap them every. So I'm thinking about your your uh, engine mount bolts right on your big tur turbines um you know oftentimes there's two of them what blows a lot of people's mind when they learn there's only two pins holding that motor on or two bolts yes there is but then yeah. bolts are about eight hundred dollars a piece you know what i mean yeah <laughs> so like if you gotta yeah. change that motor every two thousand hours yeah i mean that's that's added oh yeah and uh, and again, like the reason why they make this because it's it's very high demand or they're highly demanded and it's less expensive because I mean you know newer manufacturing processes, newer newer manufacturing resources, etc. 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 Like it's easier for a third party to make them versus however many years ago when they were originally made. Shit, nowadays, man, we can print metallic parts or metallic components. Not 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 like no kit, not like uh, or a little bit like. Uh, 3D printing where we shoot resin into form it into a shape, but these ones is no kidding metallic metal parts. Like uh, I, there was one show I can't remember what it was where they 3D printed a whole engine block and it worked just fine. Like you never would have guessed it was a 3D printed engine block until like they told you the whole process. It's pretty cool. I can't. I, maybe I should find a link for that again. Just share it for everybody. It's pretty nice. That and then pretty cool. And then again is with the salvage yard stuff, right? Uh, the cool part about a salvage yard is, you know, like this something has been long since forgotten. And if you go to a reputable salvage yard or at least a place where you you know what you're looking for, you can find this stuff for like dirt cheap, right? Like uh, maybe like half of a fuselage that just may, needs some rework, but you'll probably get it for like 5% of what it was originally worth or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. 
uh, the the drawback of salvage art, as with anything salvage art, right, is you got to make sure that this is still usable. <laughs> it's still usable, and then uh, that you could actually use it for your for your aircraft. Oh uh, yeah. Now now don't don't get us wrong. You you're not just gonna go to the boneyard and pull a fuel control off and slap it on your plane and go. It's it's not not so cut and dry. <laughs> no, no, you know, no, you're gonna have to bring that thing back to zero time. You're gonna have to go through it and ensure internal seals or whatever aren't dry rotted, cracked. In fact, you're probably just gonna go through and replace them all. That would be the smart, safe thing to do. Right, um, and that, and that's another thing too. When you're getting any sort of parts, right, new, old, semi old, used, whatever, is you have to have like pristine documentation of this stuff to ensure that it's flight worthy that it's usable and then you're tracking like how much is being used of like especially with something like salvage parts we don't know what was done to it so you kind of have to zero time it on and just kind of have like some kind of engineering assessment that says like well like we don't know what it is so we're going to limit it to this much time uh before we have to replace it again so unless like it's one of those like it's just it's just there to complete the set and not actually do anything. <laughs> yeah, or you say, okay, uh, we've installed this the salvage part. Ten hours reinspects for X Y Z at twenty hours reinspect for X Y Z, and then mm-hmm. from there, you know, that kind of gives you some checkpoints to make sure there's no impending failures or whatever else. And then that time, obviously, between inspection can can get a little wider as you you gain that trust with it. Right. Um, exactly. The component. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at an advisory circular here from the FAA. Now it's from 2010, so a little bit old, but if I know anything about the FAA is that not a whole lot changes (laughs) with, uh, how they view things. Mm -hmm. Um, so what it says here for owner operator produced part parts that were produced by an owner operator for installation on their own aircraft, i.e. by a certified air carrier or certificated air carrier. An owner operator is considered a producer of a part if the owner participated in controlling the design, manufacture, or quality of the part. Participating in the design of the part can include supervising the manufacturer of the part or providing the manufacturer with the following. The design data, the materials, with which to make the part, the fabrication processes, assembly methods, or the quality control procedures. So that is what the FAA has to say about an owner-operator produced part. Now, interestingly enough, a couple paragraphs down, uh, there's this uh, discussion here on this advisory circular, and it says, it says the FAA continues to receive reports of replacement parts being offered for sale as aircraft quality when the quality and the origin of the parts are unknown or questionable. Such parts may be advertised or presented as unused, like new or remanufactured. These imply <laughs> that the quality of the parts is equal to an acceptable part. Purchasers of these parts may not be aware of the potential hazards involved with the replacement parts for which acceptability for installation of a tea seed product has been not been established. Yeah. So uh, there's always swindlers, right? And everything uh, mm-hmm. hucksters or whatever you want to call them. Um, and six and I were talking about this a little bit offline. You know, we know aviation is expensive. We know it's expensive to maintain an aircraft um, and these, you know, small mom and pop, shops and hell even some larger carriers right everybody's looking to make money Mm -hmm. so what they do is they acquire you know salvage parts or make these their own parts but they really don't instill the uh quality control measures that they probably should and then they sell them to other countries uh you know that maybe aren't as regulated um some countries in uh the you know far far middle east um or in south america Uh, i know uh this is mm, 2000 probably 14 time frame but i know there was an issue back then when i was working on on the private jets and people were taking uh you know those kind of parts and or taking old parts off of aircraft here in the states that are out of you know they they hit their high time limit 
uh, and instead of sending them back to be overhauled or whatever else, they would sell them to these smaller uh, operators in South America, these little jungle hoppers in the Amazon or whatever. And then the parts would fail and just planes were going down left and right. You know, obviously mm-hmm. we don't hear about it too much because we're up here. Um, and, you know, those those countries aren't regulated as heavy as the FAA regulates us. And and now you kind of see why it's so heavily regulated safety. Yes. But, but planes were going down left and right. And it, after, met, you know, those countries ended up calling on investigators from the FAA to go down and help out. And what they determined is there's parts that were being illegally sold into these South American countries to these smaller operators. Um, parts that were, were, you know, deemed unserviceable here, but they sell them as good down there. Mm-hmm. And, and then they fail and then loss of life and everything else. So uh, it's a pretty serious thing. Oh, yeah, very. And like what MVP was saying about the FAA regulations, if you guys want to read more about that here, I'm going to read, uh, cite it a little bit or real quick. It's part 21 of the FARS, uh, specifically uh, part 21, section 21.303. And here, uh, just to reiterate some a lot of stuff that MVP said, per the FAR, it says, except as provided in paragraphs B of this section, no person may produce a modification or a replacement part for sale for installation on a type certified product unless it is produced pursuant to a parts manufacturer approval issued under this subpart. The, this includes parts produced under a type or production certificate. Produced by owner or operator for maintaining or altering his own product, parts produced under the FAA technical standing order, or standard parts such as bolts and nuts uh, conforming to established industry standards. So that in a nutshell means like unless, and that's kind of like what makes um, owner produced parts legal is you're only making these parts for your plane, period. That's it. Like there's no resale. There's no like new. There's no looks just as good thing right if you're making your own parts it's it's understood and it's legally binding that you are not going to use this for anything else but your plane um and what and what mvp was saying on uh when he was reading some of that from the memorandum it pretty much means like a owner produced part is air quote owner produced so long as they've taken part in the manufacturing of that part right so Example, like say I own a Cessna or I own a Piper and I want uh, a component of my plane replaced because they don't make these no more. So I'm just, I can't find it on a salvage yard. There's no PMA that won't give it to me at a fair price. So I'm just going to make it my damn self. Uh, I go to a, a reputable machinist shop or sometimes even a mechanic shop and I say, hey, I, ha- I need this part made for me. Here are my design. Here are the design specs. Here are like uh, drawings or whatever that you can make this to. Do that and then get and then give it to me, right? As long as like the owner has participated in some part of the manufacturer and its quality control process, that's key, right? There is what MVP was saying. Uh, unless it has all that going, then it's air quote FAA approved. If it's missing any of those things, then. A, it's not an owner, a legal owner produced part. And B, who, everyone who touched hands on that is liable for uh, some type of penalty. <laughs> yeah. Well, did you just, I'm um, sorry, did you just go over uh, the owner produced part? What, what should be on there? Or because I'm also looking at this, uh, what a uh, technical standard order TSO markings are supposed to have and what PMA symbols are supposed to have. So, oh, I just breezed um, by those. Yeah. Oh, okay, so, so so maybe uh, just you know for those of you who don't know or who are new to the to the business or just general curiosity or maybe you forgot, um, but what the FAA says a technical standard order marking should have uh, is it must be permanently and legibly marked with the following name and address of manufacturer, the name, type, part number, or model des- designation of the article the serial number and the date of manufacture of the article or both and the applicable TSO number. Now that's for the TSO for the PMA. Uh, the PM, each PMA part should be marked with the letters FAA 
tag PMA. And then it would have the name, trademark or symbol, part number, and name and model designation of each certificated product on which the part is eligible for installation. Now, I will say, obviously, people are probably going, hey, well, there are small parts that you can't put all that information on. It's just impossible and implausible. Mm -hmm. Right. So with that, then uh, the parts tag that comes with it is supposed to incorporate all that material. Now, even for a part that's big enough to have all that information on there, the parts tag should still come with that. Yes. Um, and I'll say this, whenever you get a part and a parts tag, match the two together. Cause I have received parts before where the parts tag was incorrect for the part. Received. Absolutely. And, and I will tell you this, when you do that, uh, do not accept that part, send it back. Hey, yes. Tag, tag, you know, green tag or whatever doesn't match the part. Um, now sometimes different operators, they do hold the right that they can say, Oh, uh, yeah, that was probably something messed up in the warehouse. And they'll cut you a new a new tag and they'll email it to you. But as long as you have that for your records, you're safe. But if they're not willing, oh, go ahead and we'll hit you on the back end. Nah, pound sand, Jack. I ain't yep. doing crap with that part until I get matching documentation. Absolutely. Because otherwise the part's in an unknown status. I don't yes. know what this is. Yes. Well, you got a fuel control and the tag says it's a fuel control, but the model numbers are different. Well, uh, Okay, the model that's on the fuel control is what I need for this installation, but the tag doesn't match. Okay, so what's the problem? I have an unknown part. What is this? You know? Mm hmm. Yep. And uh, that's where we as aircraft maintenance technicians really come into play because although an owner can produce a part, owners are not allowed to install the part. And this is kind of where MVP was alluding to is like if the part and the parts tag don't match or the part and the parts information don't match or something just ain't jiving, it is your responsibility to reject that part because you, us as aircraft maintainers are us as aircraft inspectors, us as, as quality assurance, we are the last step but, uh, maintenance wise or certification and airworthiness wise before that plane leaves the deck. And uh, this kind of goes into like what uh, the memorandum was also talking about that a part must have four characteristics to be air quote FAA approved. And this, uh, these four characteristics means like it must have been properly designed, either some kind of FAA approved design. It has to have drawings, specifications, airworthiness certs, and all sorts of stuff, which is generally on the parts tag itself or has some kind of means for you to look up the design spec on this every every certified part has this uh the second one it must be produced to, to conform to the design right so it's not like just uh me taking a landing gear and then taking it to a a machine shop and it says here make it look like this you know it has to have exact specifications like it can only be this wide it can only be this long it has to be able to have this kind of characteristics and so on and so forth like you're not going to try to tell someone to make a titanium part out of aluminum. It's just not going to happen. I mean, they may not know better because they just see shiny metal. Like, okay, whatever. This is as cheap as we can go. Or this is the only metal we got, which has happened, <laughs> which has happened. Uh, the third one is like the part has to be uh, the production and its whole conception to production has to be properly documented. This kind of goes with the car, the parts tag. This goes with who inspected it, who made it, uh, at what point of the process did it get checked for any sort of criticalities, the whole nine yards. So you're basically doing like the OEM's job for them. And then the fourth one, it has to be, uh, the it, the part has to be properly maintained in accordance with the FARS part 43 or, or the equivalent to whatever aviation authority you guys are at. And with, with those four characteristics in mind, if either of those four are missing for that customer owned part, then it's technically illegal. And us as aircraft technicians, us as aircraft inspectors, maintainers, what, uh, what, what have you, if any of those four characteristics are missing and we install it, it's we're just as liable as the owner for producing an illegal part because we would know better. We ought to know better. We should know better that, yo, there's something pretty janky about this part. And, um, I will also add that depending on what the part is, 
may require a special signature, like say uh, uh, an inspection authority signature, and that's with almost anything major or some type of condition inspection. If it's minor, like or not a major critical flight science critical part, pretty much any light any certified AMP can sign this off, right? But again, with that said, like you have to be pretty damn careful, especially keeping in mind those four characteristics that they they exist and they're present and they're traceable, because if there's anything wrong with it or any of those characteristics are missing, the incident report, if should anything crazy happen, we'll find it and your name we blast it all over it. <laughs> Sadly, but that's what it is. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So y- y- your license will be suspended while the investigation's underway. Oh yes. Oh yes. Uh, so some simple challenges, right? Like, cause we ourselves, we were kind of batting this amongst ourselves, like throughout the episode, like, uh, let's say I kind of gave the example already, but say like an owner, uh, needs a, a landing gear strut replaced uh, for his Cessna or for his beach craft or whatever the hell he commissions a third party machine shop to manufacture the part. Is it an owner produced part or is it a repair? Right. Um, and then uh, another scenario is say uh, an aircraft wing is damaged. Um, the skin's damaged. The rib is damaged. The stringer's damaged. And with the replacement for that, would that be, or any of the work required, would that be an owner produced thing or would it be a repair thing? S- some of these, they, they kind of, the nuance of these kind of get a little shady. Um, but to like, uh, to the effect of what we've been saying before, uh, it's, it, whether it's owner produced or not, it has to have those four characteristics. Now, let's say <clears throat> in the example of the rip, of the wing repair, if you order the parts, you as a mechanic, if you ordered the parts, they came in and there's some stuff that you had to fabricate, like say like the rib or the stringer or, you know, a patch for the skin. You don't just do this willy nilly. You, you, you don't just like, well, you know, it, just make it to fit, <laughs> There's a lot of standard practices that you learn as an as a aircraft technician. There's some common tools that you use, like uh, metal files or chisels or rivets, rivet guns, stuff like that. If it's within that common core understanding, basic general stuff, and you're using it to a design spec that's provided by whoever else that has FAA approval, then you're solid. It counts as a repair, and you as a mechanic are technically reco- able to do that. Now... Uh, backtracking a little bit, we as mechanics, we are specifically uh, not able to produce parts. That, that's that's why they really uh, they really put that in there as far as like owner produced because we as mechanics we don't own the plane and we are not allowed to produce the part. Like say like we're doing our inspections, and, hey, this part needs to get replaced or it needs to get re- uh, you need a new one. We ourselves we can't just make it from scratch, <laughs> so. This kind of this kind of a uh, uh, I would say controversial, but it kind of contradicts because a lot of times when we're in the field, we have to kind of come up with creative solutions. Let's just say that, <laughs> right? Like, uh, right. like uh, using nickels to aid in a socket set or um, bandaging things together, so to speak, air quotes bandaging things together. But that all falls in under repair. Because we are, we're doing this to some form of a res, of, of a specification or some kind of design limit that we're doing this to bring the aircraft back into service via some type of dimensional repair or design repair. Now, if we were to just be like, like just make something from nothing, like we just kind of thought it to ourselves and used our, our infinite wisdom and experience to just conjure a part that technically makes it an owner produced part, which is for our part illegal. <laughs> And uh, now, now here's the say now to ba- to add to this uh with the 20 the part 21 uh section 21303 an owner or a na- uh mechanic such as us we can produce a part if the owner a commissions us to do it or b and, and or b they supervise part of the manufacturing process or the quality control process so take it for what it's worth or take it for how in depth that needs to be. You as the owner, you as the mechanic, like um, they're watching you do it or they give you design specs or they, you know, they sign off saying that this is made to my specification or whatever the case may be. As long as they do some form of that, then it's technically on them now that it's an owner produced part, not 
a mechanic produced part if that makes any sort of sense to anybody <laughs> right but uh, but again like uh all this said it all has to meet those four characteristics and you have to ensure that that it's being signed off that way so it doesn't it doesn't fall back on you like why did you do something illegal you knowingly did something illegal and why didn't you stop it so and especially if it's something that requires an IA signature, for instance, that can turn into a serious mess real fast. Um, uh, what, what was it? an example of this I've seen in one of those articles I read? It kind of went into like that nose gear strut for it was a Cessna 140, where a uh, an IA or an AMP IA slash inspector was doing an investigation on a on a wrecked. Um, Cessna 140, and the in, the preliminary report said, "Oh, the nose gear uh, strut collapsed on itself." I'm like, how the hell did it do that? I'm like, there's no hell, there's no freaking way this thing could just collapse on itself. And so he went to go see the the damage and assessment, and it just freaking grenaded itself pretty much. I'm like, that's not right. It's not supposed to do that. And then after further investigation, they found out that the original. Um, Nose landing gear strut was replaced with a air, with a illegally owner produced part, and then the AMP mechanic who signed off on it, he knew that it was an owner produced part, but he also kind of knew, or I guess he air quote knew from how he felt the specs needed to be, and is like, well, it looks exactly like the old one, so tosses it in there, signs it off, and within like. I don't know, like 700 hours, I think it was, it failed itself and ended up wrecking on the line. So uh, that's that's a that's kind of extreme, but it's also a classic example of like, uh, was it illegal? Yes, it was because the owner didn't provide all the specifications for it. He didn't sign off. He didn't make a, a separate sign off. I'm, I'm assuming it's a he. It could be a she. I'm just saying. Um the owner didn't have some kind of sign off in their logbook saying that this is an owner produced part using this specification, blah, blah, blah. And that's another thing too, that we as mechanics need to make sure if it's something the owner made or the owner is approving, you need to have that owner have some kind of uh, sign off on it saying that they assumed the risk in designing it and making it or whatever the case may be or waivers. So to say, right. The, the, the owner, what am I trying to say here, MVP? Like the owner assumes the risk for the yeah, most part. Yeah, basically there's litigation where they they take uh, full responsibility yep. for, for the parts they made. Yes. And then uh, you as the mechanic, you can fall back on that saying like, this is, um, it's flight worthy enough and any shady shit is at the risk of the owner. So Bob's my uncle. I did my due diligence, Right. And it's it's on them now. I mean, but they still can technically hem you up for that because they say, well, didn't you exercise some common core competency or some shit like that, right? You knew it, it was suspicious enough to you. So why did you just put a stop to it? Now, again, like us as mechanics, like it just had, there's a, there's a verbiage in there about airworthiness where I can't remember the, the far part for it. I think it's 43 or something like that, where it says like the, the design or the part that's being the, the replacement part needs to uh, be just be needs to be almost exact as the original. Uh, I don't know the the uh, the exact verbiage. Or I might be just be uh, messing this up, but for the most part, us as a mechanic, we just say like this part uh, almost mirrors the original. Either almost mirrors it or almost exactly as the original or the original intent or is better. That's really all we can do about it. Like, well, besides me, like taking it up for a test flight, I really can't tell when it's on the ground. <laughs> Other than less, like right. it's some, unless it's some like blatant difference. Like this is made out of titanium and this one's made out of aluminum. Like pretty obvious yeah, difference yeah, there. It's supposed to be a, it's supposed to be a chrome plated strut. Uh, this one's 3d printed from plastic. So, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, reading this thing, the installing mechanic's responsibility is only to make a reasonable assessment 
that it is an airworthy part and to install it properly. It will likely help the mechanic feel comfortable if they are provided with a copy of the drawing, the specifications, and or have been part of the process from the beginning. So that kind of ties back in with what Six was saying and a little bit what I was saying earlier. But, you know, your responsibility is just to kind of do an overall assessment as you would on any part you're installing and say, yeah, it seems good. And the paperwork matches. Fire away. I'm going to do an ops check anyhow, you know. Yep. Oh, um, so so kind of, you know, I don't want to say stay in your lane. Maybe it's a little too coarse, but like as a mechanic, also know your limitations, you know, because some of these owners might get you to say, hey, I produce this. Just buy off on it. it will be good. You know, yep. I ain't buying off on nothing, man. That's your job. Like, don't don't do more than what is required of you. Yep. I guess uh, don't set yourself up for failure. Yes. And a lot of times, too, you have some really pushy owners like I assume the risk. Just freaking roll it. Like. I mean, you know, you'll assume the risk, but what about the other people that are going to be involved in the accident? You know, like, do they assume risk? Yeah, that, that's right. kind of one of that's kind of one of those things you can flip the script on. It's like, well, they you well, assume where's it. your paperwork that says you assume the risk? I would yes. like that for my records, please. Thank you. Yes, exactly that. Oh, and backtrack a little bit. Is so the far part or the far for it is forty three dot thirteen. It's it's coming back to me. Right? It's it's I invoked it and now it's coming back to me. And it pretty much means like it has to uh, be, uh, what's it, close to equal, uh, as close, reasonably close to equal to the original or or approved design. That's for it is, right? Without me looking up the FAR in itself and quoting it verbatim. So it has to be at least equal. So like if this thing says it's made out of titanium, you must at least equally make something out of titanium or some other metal of similar characteristics like fucking vibranium or some shit, you know? <laughs> right. So freaking Black Panther stuff, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, or Wakanda stuff. <laughs> and then, uh, again, uh, d- double tap in this, especially for the mechanic side, because we have seen some very pushy owners and I uh, could only assume in the general aviation world that this stuff is rampant. Right. That's probably why we see a lot of uh, videotape crashes and stuff like that is because uh, owners get kind of desperate or they, they want to save a buck to produce of their own or have some other means that air quotes saves a buck. And it ends up being a not so saving grace of a of a component change and then it ends up freaking destroying itself. So, again, us as mechanics, we are like the last um, check in the box before. This thing takes off in the air. Obviously, the pilot has his own thing. But as far as airworthiness certification is concerned, you're that last signature. You're that final stamp off. You're that that last quality check to ensure everything was done correctly. And uh, certain entities that might be not so big of a deal. But if you're like the only version of a quality assurance metric, especially in general, in the general aviation realm, that can hold some serious weight. Especially like if the the nearest closest quality assurance or quote quality assurance representative is like two counties away, that turns into a huge fucking deal. Um, uh, sometimes like I've seen some uh, some mechanics they require the the owner to make some kind of a statement uh, saying that. That's so, so funny! I was just about to say the same thing. <laughs> it's not unreasonable for the mechanic to ask the owner to make a logbook entry that they provided a part produced under FAR twenty 21- one dot nine a uh you know open parentheses a close parentheses open parentheses five close parentheses and provide the information used for its manufacturer Mm -hmm. so don't don't hesitate to ask i guess you know as maintainer you know say owner says here install this for me cool go ahead and write this up big dog you know yeah yeah and then then have all the documentation lined up for it and honestly it should almost like like we were saying towards the middle of this episode, any part, every part should have all sorts of documentation, should have some traceability, should have some kind of design specification tied to it, whether it be from the original manufacturer, from uh, the PMA, whatever, right? Uh, there's some nuance to it too, like say like the or the OEM or the original manufacturer spec or the PMA spec just doesn't exist anymore because it's so old and outdated and they changed names and went out of business or some shit. So 
if I if I say me an owner, I take like whatever part it is. I don't have the design specs. I tell some really smart kid or really smart person that hey, reverse engineer this so I can make more of it. That uh, te- that new reverse engineering design technically belongs to you, and that also means that you have to get some kind of approval authority to ensure that this is done right and that it's actually within airworthiness specifications. And us say as mechanics, like if we have questions about this or that you get a a owner that's extra pushy, push it to the FISDO, man. <laughs> push it to the FA. Let them handle it. <laughs> I'm sure they have no problems <laughs> like crushing somebody's dreams, you know, about about doing some illegal shit. I'm pretty sure. Um that's probably like the one of the times I'll I'll straight I'll straight up um uh, illicit the FA, the FISDOs help, but if you need them, that'd be one of the main times to get it. Like, I don't know, man. Like, this doesn't seem right. I'm going to go forward this to the local FISDO. Uh, watch that tune change real fast. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, um, you know, it, 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 you just get them involved. Don't set yourself up for failure. Yes. Just, uh, you know, um, like, like six, they get the uh Fizzo involved and here I I, I was gonna tie in with that so sorry I was fumbling around uh with my paperwork here. Um it says report reporting suspected unapproved parts or a sub subs are parts, components or materials that may not be approved or acceptable as described in paragraphs earlier on in this uh advisory circular. Some appear to be uh as good as the part manufactured from the FAA approved source. However there are Maybe manufacturing processes that were not performed in accordance with FAA approved data or at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So, how to report a sub, right? Uh, persons with possible knowledge of safety violations or other circumstances that may affect aviation safety are encouraged to report them in accordance with the AC 21 TAC 29. This AC includes procedures for referral of such reports to the appropriate FAA office. Reports may be filed using FAA form. 8120 TAC 11, suspected unapproved parts notification, or by calling the toll free FAA Aviation Safety Hotline at 1 800 255 1111. Yes. So there you go. There we go. I think you got some faulty parts or some bad stuff there, and people are pushing it, man, report them. Yeah. Now, now again, like, this is this is a lot of CYA so like cover your own ass. And and realistically man like I would not risk my certification, my license, my livelihood because something seems eh, a little shady, right? Now, there's a there, there can be a fine line between owner produced and repair, but I think one of the key differences between owner produced and repair is is it a is it the design specs that were provided by the owner like it was specifically made by the owner? Or is it like from a manufacturer, right? Like the owner like just had like some kind of drawing manual or whatever. If it's from an OEM or from a PMA and it's not uh, designed by the owner, then that's technically covered. That becomes a repair at that point, right? But uh, again, like if you have any sort of questions, like raise the flag, put up, put it up in the air, ask the FISDO if you absolutely have to. But that's really just to save your ass because if something does go down and something bad happens, your name is probably first on the list on the blame game. Guaranteed. Like, yeah, who oh. worked on it last? It's exactly what it is. Even if you didn't touch that system that failed, you're you're going to be under investigation because your name is in the logbook very recently. Yes. Or last. Um, and guilty until proven innocent. Ask me how I know. <laughs> yes. Uh, what's the... There's a statement that... Um, a lot of uh, A&P mechanics have to write in that says that it's airworthy. I can't remember the exact verbiage and I think a lot of them do it different, but it's more or less saying like, I certify that this aircraft is airworthy and safe to fly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Signature date, um, certificate number, right? Something to that effect. But that more or less says like everything and anything that's wrong with this plane has been checked. It's within limits and it's good to go. So even it, like as MVP said, even though you didn't touch that system, even though you didn't, that part that you affected or changed was not part of that system at all. 
your overall signature to return that plane in the service pretty much blanket punishes you for everything that could have possibly went wrong unless it's been determined that it was indeed a uh, like an operator induced fall or it was like the, the he caught a torn some kind of tornado or something like that but nine times eight times out of ten it's going to be your assumed your fault so do yourself a favor if you can save yourself that ass pain or save yourself from being questioned in that manner like though they probably just do it as a formality say hey what did you do what did you touch what did you see like, well, I did this, this, and this. Here's all my paperwork. Here's all the stuff I looked at. Here's all the stuff I signed, et cetera, et cetera. It, they'll make you feel like shit the whole time they're doing it. But uh, in the end, if you were doing it right and they oh, yeah, you're gonna feel you like did, you're going you to did prison. it right. Yeah, you're going to feel like you're, you're going to prison. But, you know, like I said, that's why it's important to annotate everything. But, you know, even if you did the last release for flight, um, and you, you know, you kind of certified everything. That, okay, you're suspended until we get this investigation. And they look through and say, "Well, this part's the reason that failed." So and so released her for flight, but they only worked on this system, which isn't tied to this other one at all. Um, so you're you're buying off the work that you know you're releasing for flight for the work that you did. There's no way you could have known that there yep. was a flaw in that system. The work you were there for didn't entail that system. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so from that point, they'll say, "Okay." So and so is cleared, you know, back to work you go, and then they're on to the next person. All right, who worked that system last? Oh, this mm-hmm. person. Boy, good luck to you. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point, and I'm glad you brought that up because I, I was starting to fumble up uh, a little bit, uh, but uh, I'm glad MVP brought that up, especially right because they they can. It's kind of like to go from inspection point to inspection point, unless you somehow touch that system or you knew about it. Again, just like do that CYA stuff, which is why documentation is such a big thing. I mean, we'll have, we'll have some mechanics out there who will fight us on this. Like, well, it said it said to remove door, install door. That's fine as rain. I mean, you're absolutely right. But again, they like treat it like you're like you're under investigation. Give as much detail as possible of what you did, what you saw, what you what you heard. So it just eliminates um, those questions. I if if that makes any sort of sense to anybody. <laughs> I always, yeah, I always tell people, write it so I nobody can come back and ask you questions. Yes. It's plain as day in there, what you did and what you did in accordance with. Yep. You know, um, I have a kind of a big problem on the program where I'm at right now and the maintenance group just, just remove panel. <laughs> what panel and why, you know? Like, yeah. Is that, don't, don't do that kind of stuff, but, you know, nature of it is, is they're they're just being lazy and often and often they haven't been trained properly is what i'm determining but their own you know leadership doesn't seem to care but due to the again due to the nature of the program um you know they don't they're not made to care they don't have uh certain entities breathing down their neck Mm -hmm. um that we would have you know in other realms so uh but but just you know, I, I across no matter what program platform, military, commercial, private, otherwise, just put as much detail in there as you can, and write legibly. Yes. Because I, I got to tell you, you know, a lot of these uh, carriers don't. Uh, you'll never meet them. You'll never meet their maintenance control. You're always talking to them via phone, and they 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 don't see the work you do on the aircraft, but they see the paperwork you send in. And if your handwriting looks like that of a three year old. Come on, like you're you're already judged. I I promise you, because I do it. Jesus Christ, you're a full grown adult, and your handwriting's like this. What is happening? Yep. Like who let you work on this plane? And you might be a mechanical genius, but if I, you know, if I if I've never met you, and all I have to go off is your handwriting, bad bad stuff. Right. <laughs> no good Sorry. juju. That wasn't related to parts. Everybody, I went off on a. I think I, I think I blacked out for a second. <laughs> Having like the the ass pain of the day just really trickle in. I'm sorry, appreciate, <laughs> sorry everybody, <laughs> but it's true. This oh, is yeah. an ongoing thing, and uh, uh, to go on on with just tangent off on a smidge with uh, owner produced parts. Uh, MVP touched this earlier in the episode with his counterfeit parts, and just like that, with like they're owner produced, but they don't say they're owner produced. They're like like new or similar to new or or almost or just as good right that technically makes it counterfeit parts and that becomes a huge issue 
So again, uh, do your due diligence. If any, if anything, question the part, question the owner, question the paperwork that it's with, and all else fails, man. Just like I mean, you're that final signature. So if you don't buy it off, they can't do anything about it, uh, other than try to find someone else who's sucker enough to to sign it off. So, <laughs> um, final thoughts on anything, MVP. Uh, no, not really. We kind of touched on everything. Um, you know, just do your due diligence, as we've said in many episodes before, and as you all know how to do. Um, and and make sure your paperwork matches what uh, what parts you're putting in. I can't harp on that enough. Ensure your parts tags and your certification paperwork and your test paperwork that anything that comes with that all matches. Mm-hmm. Yes, and. Hey, let us know what you think, right? Uh, do you come across uh, owner-produced parts? You any good stories, bad stories, horror stories? Uh, have you produced uh, your own parts? Like, let us know in the in the comments of this. Let us know on our social media, our our Gmail, our website, whichever is the easiest way for you. The absolute best way to get in touch with us, provide feedback, and have similar discussions like this is to get on Patreon and join our Discord. We have all sorts of conversations exactly like this. And this actually came up because one of our uh, one of our major patrons, he's actually starting a business that's similar to what we just talked about. And this is probably going to be a very real and and a constant headache of his. <laughs> so good luck to him and I hope your business does well. Uh, we'll give a sh- we'll give a, uh, a link in the in the show notes as to what that business is going to be once it actually starts up. So, again, let us know what you think. Uh, hit us up. And on that note, uh, see everybody next time and catch you again soon. Bye, everybody. We would like to take this time to thank our patrons for supporting our show and allowing us to make episodes, maintain our gear, and create merch for all of our listeners. With special thanks to Erica Lamont, Chris Hawkins, Eric Shaw, Dan Schubert, Ryan Frushauer, Kyle Keir, Mike Sherwood, Caleb Stockhill, and Jennifer Brofer. Thank you all so much for your support and patronage. If you like our show, please support us on Patreon. You'll receive awesome perks like access to our private Discord, discounts and early access to our merch, first glimpse of our comics and other projects, and so much more. You can further support us and show off your prowess as an aircraft specialist by visiting our shop at cancelformaintenance.com. If you like classy or rugged watches, visit our affiliate Rockwell Time at rockwelltime.com. Use the code CX the number 4MX, to save 10% off your total order. If you have suggestions for the show or you'd like to be a guest on the show, send us a line on our contact us section at cancelformainness.com and we'll do what we can to get both your ideas and yourself on the show. Please support us on social media like Facebook at Cancel for Maintenance, Instagram at C-A-N-X for Maintenance Podcast, or Twitter at C-X-M-X Podcast. Please check out our new comic series on the Tapas app. Like, share, subscribe, and comment on our comics. Let us know what you think. Thank you all so much for your support and listenership, and we will catch you all next time.